information on this webinar is general information and should not be viewed as applicable to your individual situation and or circumstance. We recommend that if you have questions on your individual situation that you follow up with either your attorney or specific accountant. Please also understand that the information we are providing is extremely fluid, is changing on a daily basis, and often getting superseded. What we present here today may very likely be irrelevant or incorrect tomorrow. As such, please know that it is only accurate as of today, certainly not going forward, and that even as of today, the information is only our best understanding based on how we have reviewed or interpreted the information. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our webinar today. Uh, we appreciate everyone coming in and logging in. Um, it's becoming a more regular thing, certainly, and it's uh, feeling like things are settling in a little bit. I'd say uh, we're definitely feeling that here at uh, in Trust and in Solutions um, as we work through things and continue to work through tax returns and continue to work through an understanding all that these programs have to offer. Um, I've, I've hoped that I've had a chance to talk with each one of you individually. Uh, regarding your specific circumstance as well um, and we've kind of hopefully formulated a plan and now we're just putting that plan in place a lot of what we're going to talk about today is some of the more details that come within the program as we're seeing things through again as we uh, have referenced several times within the disclaimer and the disclosures here things change so quickly and um, it's no ex exception for today either i was joking with uh, steve here that um, right before we went to put the presentation together and uh, have this discussion, um, literally five minutes beforehand, we got an email that changed some of the information that we had presented, just like last week. And so it seems that it's always happening, it's always changing, and, and hopefully as we're, we're able to pull things together, some of the information that we've provided hasn't gone inconsistent with what we've done, and hopefully it's, the changes are more just detailed in nature um, and helping us to understand some of the information rather than complete, oops, we went the wrong direction. We have had a couple of those, certainly, um, and so as we listen and as we look through this, uh, keep asking yourself, okay, are we still on the right path, or do we need to make a slight adjustment to account for this new information that's come out? Um, we continue to have this new information. A lot of it is coming in the form of frequently asked questions and details that are coming out by the SBA, by the legislature, um, and by other governing bodies as they've put this together and have actually now started implementing these different programs. Um, again, what today what hopefully we're going to talk about a little bit is just a quick update on the recovery rebate credit, where that's coming, where that's at. That's the stimulus checks that are out there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the different um, programs, uh, kind of some of the information that's come, the new things. Um, but this is definitely the week of the self-employed. Um, the, the, the businesses that have employees in the past um, have been going through the application process and have now kind of got a little handle of that. If you have either applied or got a good plan of where they're going, um, this week is the week of the self-employed. So they're now going through, the, they're starting to see um, the impacts of the um, ability to be able to apply for some of these programs, to be able to apply for unemployment. Um, we're going to shift a little bit into specifically unemployment in Michigan. Um, a lot of information has been released over the last couple of days, including now being able to apply online uh, for unemployment in the state of Michigan if you are self-employed. Um, so a big development there, and we'll talk through a little bit on that. Um, and then we'll just kind of circle back again on the uh, business incentives and in a little bit of uh, what we're seeing there. Um, so on the recovery rebate credit, um, the payments have begun. Um, you should start seeing them in your checking accounts. They have confirmed that some of the initial early on batches have been deposited and are there. Um, keep in mind that they're rolling them out in batches. And so if you don't see them yet, don't be surprised. They're starting with everyone that made less than $10,000. And that is a very large batch that they're working through. Then they're moving up to the $20,000 mark, then the 40, and then kind of upwards from there. Um, so again, keep in mind as you're, as you're looking through things, if, you're, if you made more in 2019 than 10,000 or 20,000, you're behind a little bit on the batches that are coming forward. Um, we also have some information to provide here that they have put up on the IRS website um, a site that you can go in and put the information in if the IRS does not have your bank account information. 
Um, so what I did here is I linked um, to, the, on the bottom of this presentation here, um, on this page, it's the irs.gov coronavirus slash non-filers enter payment information here. Um, that link is there. It's also on our website as you go, or you can just Google search it as well, or just search it um, that are out there. So this, this here is the first page that you're going to come to if you do um, elect to utilize this service. So this would be for the non-filers. Um, you're going to fill out the form in your work forward on getting them the bank account inf information. Now keep in mind here, it's not as great as we were hoping it would be. Um, as with many of these programs that we're going to be talking about today, the devils are the, the devils in the details. And as these they roll these programs out, we're finding that it's not quite as good as we hope for pretty much across the board. Um, but specifically for this one here, as we're talking through on the ability to provide the government with your um, bank account information for those that don't have that already in, um, there's a big caveat on here that what you do not want to use this service for is if you if you receive the social security a railroad retirement um, you don't want to use this form if you've already filed your 2019 tax return don't use this form if your and here's the big one if your 2019 gross income exceeds 12,200 if you're single or 24,400 if you're married you have to file a tax return versus using this form so again, what they're doing is they're saying this is not a replacement for filing your tax return. This is only if you have income less than a tax return is necessitated and therefore you can use this service instead of filing a tax return. And honestly, if you're in this case, filing a tax return may be just as easy. Um, so keep in mind, this does not give you a, uh, a reason of just saying, okay, let's not file a tax return. Um, as we've worked through our individual clients here, we are certainly putting priorities on those that did not file or that, that filed for 2018 that maybe weren't qualifying. So really looking through for those for 2019 where it would make a difference. Um, and again, I would suggest that you look back at some of the old presentations that are out there now. Um, we're starting to build a, a library there on our website, so you can feel free to reference those. They are all out there. Um, they're also on YouTube as well, and so if you want to follow, click, like, all that fun stuff over at YouTube, you'll be able to see those when we put them out too. Um, but in those, we're going to go through the details of what specifics are in that program, who qualifies, and, and other things. I did want to take a moment here before we dive into too many of the details on um, the business side of things um, that we are we are seeing an increased amount of notices, alerts, awareness of fraud in cybersecurity that is out there as a result of COVID-19. So the FBI actually came out this last week um, and, and issued another guidance. I used a, a, a bulletin here that came from last month, um, but we are seeing significant increase in fraud and cybersecurity risks um, that are out there as a result of this. So be aware of that, especially when it comes to the stimulus checks. Um, a lot of the fraudsters are using this as an opportunity to um, call up um, some of the older um, generations that are there that may be thinking they have to do certain things. You don't have to do anything. So keep that in mind. If you see an email that tells you to follow up and respond, don't link through it. Don't click through to that. Um, so there's the cybersecurity threats. Um, in addition, we're also seeing, as businesses are now being forced to work remotely, um, challenges coming with working remotely, the, the IT side of things. Um, privacy concerns, HIPAA and other privacy considerations. Um, so much so that we're actually going to be doing a webinar on those as well. Um, the group, the, the IT group that we work with, Insight Digital, is also going to be doing a webinar similar to what we're doing here. Um, that's going to focus on some of those things that you might be able to consider both from an individual standpoint as well as a business standpoint as you're looking to work remotely. Um, so pulling back a little bit on the business incentives here as I shift into those, um, I want to remind you that we've got a couple different programs here. I'm going to go in some of those details and we're going to spend some time looking at those um, now even further as we're finding more information being provided. So we've got the PPP, which is the Payroll Protection Program. We've got the EIDL, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. The ERC, which is the Employee Retention Credit, Unemployment, and the Payroll Tax Holiday. Um, so those are all still there. I do recommend that you um, look to our last week's seminar to truly understand kind of some of the differences um, here. But again, one of the big things I want to point out is 
As we look at these different programs, your circumstances may be different than others. And so if you're hearing or reading about a particular program in the news, don't necessarily assume that's the right one for you. It may be, um, but make sure you look at your specific circumstances to what makes the most sense for you um, on those. And, and I'm going to go again through some details as, as we uh, get into this on some of the things that have rolled out in this last week. Um, you, you, as I mentioned it earlier on in the presentation here that this is definitely the week of the self-employed, um, that we've now seen the rollout for standard businesses and now we're going into self-employed. Um, now I'm going to kind of jump right into the detail on that self-employed here. Um, so again, uh, thank you for the patience for those that aren't self-employed as we work through this. Um, the self-employed actually does give us unfortunately a little bit of an easier um, scenario to walk through only because unfortunately it's limited um, on the programs that we can use. So right off the bat, Economic Injury Disaster Loan or the EIDL does not qualify if you're self-employed. So any earnings or net income as a result of that does not qualify for the EIDL. So we can just write that one right off. The employer retention credit, the same thing that does not employ for it does not account um, for self-employed income. And so you can just write that one right off as well, which is going to pretty much push the self-employed into one of two options, either unemployment or the payroll protection program. And again, you have to keep in mind, you can't use both of those hand in hand. The point of the payroll protection program is to avoid having unemployment. And so you can't use both. Now, you can do both programs, just not at the same time. So you may choose to do unemployment for a little bit and then payroll protection program or vice versa. Um, but keep in mind, all of these stimulus packages and strategies are designed for this immediacy right now. This is not designed for a long range economic benefit. It's designed to, to take into account the fact that you are home and not working during the period now for maybe another couple weeks or maybe another month or so. Um, these are not currently designed as long range plans. And so it's not like you can say, well, I'm going to do the unemployment for the next three months and then do the payroll protection program. No, the payroll protection program is going to be probably gone by then. Um, and likewise, if you do the payroll protection program, unemployment may not qualify later, depending on how in timing of what that is. So let's talk a little bit about Michigan unemployment. That I think is probably the biggest news here that we've had in this last week is that it is now, the Michigan unemployment is now opened up to the self-employed, um, which includes uh, Schedule C, Schedule F, so farming, if you are impacted, um, is also now available for this, as well as um, if you are a LLC, taxed as an S corporation. Um, those also are going to be considered in the self-employment. Um, I, I could spend a lot of time going through all the details that are there, and I'm going to spend some, but what I'm going to point out there is you'll see right there, the, it's my WAM, which is the Michigan Works Account Manager. That's the Michigan Unemployment website that you're going to get to know quite well if you're going to go to utilize the unemployment. Um, they have a website, or they have the, the website that's just been updated, and on that website, pretty early on in the process, is a toolkit. And I would highly suggest, if this is your first time going through unemployment, that you download that toolkit. It's 100 pages long, so I'm not saying you're going to be reviewing all of it, but you'll see an example here where they have, where I put it on the slide, um, they walk through step by step by step what you need to do for each question that you're going through. And so that's going to probably provide the most detailed information that you can have as you walk through, how do I answer this question? Or what question do I need? Or I'm not quite sure on this particular one. We're here as well, but know that a first stop for you to go would probably be that toolkit work paper that you're going to walk through. Now, this just got announced yesterday. Um, but what they've shown for self-employed, a big, a big determination that they were trying to determine was how are they going to qualify self-employed for unemployment. Again, the, the normal unemployment prior to self-employment was based on the highest quarter of the last five quarters, and then you would max at 362 per week. So unemployment is based on a weekly benefit. Um, and it was maxed at $362. So if as an employee you made $500 a week, you would be maxed at $362. If you made $200 a week, you'd be maxed at $200. And that's based on your highest quarter 
for the last five quarters divided by the weeks that are in there. And so if you're a seasonal employee, they're going to take the time when you were in seasonal to give you the unemployment in the off season, hypothetically. Now for the unemployment, or the, I'm sorry, for the self-employed, it's changed a little bit. One of the things that we're, we just got notified on this one is that as people are applying for it, they have the option to not provide any information that is gonna give them on the income, because again, the, the unemployment doesn't have your income yet, you have not provided it to them. If you don't provide them any information on numbers, you will be getting the minimum weekly benefit of $160 per week, plus the $600 that is coming through the federal government. It's, it's through the state, but it's the federal government that's in there. So you would get $760 per week and not provide any detailed information. If you wanted to increase that to get up to the 362 max plus the 600, um, then you would be able to provide the, either a Schedule C or a Schedule F or a, your prior year tax return if you're a partnership. Um, and we're gonna go through that in a second here too. But keep in mind that you have the state benefit plus the federal benefit paid through the state for a maximum of $962 without providing any information on numbers you're gonna get the $760. If you potentially provide information, you could get up to $962. And that's per week. What I've shown you here on the screen is, uh, it's the actual questionnaire that comes along with the paper file of applying for unemployment. Most people aren't gonna be using the paper file, but I wanted to take this as an opportunity to walk through a couple of the questions that you are gonna probably have to answer online. And this gets into the question of, well, can I even qualify for unemployment um, if I'm a self-employed? I've never done this, what does that mean? Well, I've starred the, the four of the key questions here. It's number three, four, five, and six. Um, so were you performing any services in connection with the self-employment at the time of the disaster? The disaster is, when they shut down the uh, the economy. So it's gonna be dependent on which declaration you use, either a February 1st, a February 15th, or a March um, date. Um, but the answer here is, is if, you, and if you need the specific date that applies to you, let us know. But in general, you, most people are gonna be able to say yes or no to this. If it, The key here is, if you stop doing work prior to this and you weren't working during that period, you don't qualify for unemployment. You know, so if you closed your business and retired last year, you can't just keep going again this year. Um, or if you weren't working right before, you can't just now all of a sudden get on unemployment. Um, and so that's the first question you have to do. The second one is, is the disaster preventing you performing all the services in conjunction with the self-employment? Um, so if you can continue working, then you're not unemployed. If you can answer the question that the, 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 this disaster has stopped you from performing your services, then you can answer yes to this. And then since becoming unemployed, have you been performing or are you able to perform any of the services? And then the sixth one is, is at the time of the disaster, was the self-employment your primary occupation? Those are key for all of those that you're gonna have to go through. Um, and then you'll note at the very bottom of this section, and online it'll be electronic, um, but you're gonna certify that. So you, you, these are pretty serious questions that you're gonna have to go through and answer that whether you can answer truthfully on this information. Um, and, and so just be aware that you are certifying that those answers and those questions are that you, you've done the best of your ability to answer those. There are two ways that they are looking at um, finding out information if you do wish to go above the 160 towards the 362. Um, one of them, they're looking at the hours worked on a given time period. So you can see on the screen there um, where they've done, it's on a 15 day period that they're gonna ask you to go in and fill the number of hours you worked in each one of those two week blocks. Um, there's gonna be that information as well as this information here for net earnings. So it's not gross earnings, it's net earnings. So if you're a Schedule C or a, a, a sole proprietor, um, it's not the total dollars you made in, it's dollars you made in less your expenses. So you're going to want to look to your 2019 tax return to find that in, information. And I'm going to reference that as an example later. Um, but you're going to use your Schedule C, you're going to use your Schedule F for the, if you're a farm, Schedule E or the 1065 and a partnership return. Um, or a K-1 that you may get those. If you need questions on those, give us a call. We'll walk you through and point you to write the exact questions that you're gonna need. 
But here's the key is they're going to be looking for it on a quarter by quarter basis to come up with the total for that year. Um, so keep in mind that you're going to have to do some calculations inside of there because the tax returns are based on a annual basis, whereas this is on a quarterly basis to add up to the annual basis. And again, you're going to certify this when you put it in. So you're going to provide the information. Um, you're going to certify that the information is correct, and then that's how they're going to proceed. You may make the determination that that extra, the extra um, documentation is not worth it. And if you can certify an answer to the questions in general, um, you may choose to do the 160 plus the 600 and just get 760 a week um, as compared to the potential increase up to the 962. That's the decision you're going to have to make to determine whether it makes sense for you to go through that process or not. And here I'm going to highlight again, I had the slide already, but I wanted to circle back. And again, um, this, is, this is very significant information for us and for everybody that's out there is that you would qualify without providing any additional financial information for the $160 for the state of Michigan plus the $600. So that's a $760 total benefit per week. Note that it may come in two different checks. Um, same method that you have elected for the state. Um, but it will come in the same method. Um, and then you have the chance of taking that 160 to increase it to the 362 if you provide additional documentation. Here's an example on the slide where I was referring to earlier where, um, where I've got the little star. That's the net income number that you would use for the annual year. So your quarterly totals have to come up to what your annual um, total is there. Um, Note there is that one question, and again, I'm going to mention the devils in the details, uh, that they're assuming that this is for one business. There are individuals that have more than one business. Um, you're going to have to look at your particular circumstance to determine do you add different businesses together because they're all part of a similar um, business or are they separate from each other? Um, and you, you can't just assume that you could take all of your business income. Likewise, you don't necessarily have to take a, a net a loss against a gain. You know, so if you have one business that loses money, another one that makes money, you may choose one over the other if it's your primary business source. Okay, wanted to shift a little bit here now, switching gears, um, talking, and this is now away from the self-employed. Um, and shifting a little bit just on a, a pretty big update that we're, we're seeing as we're looking through this. And this relates on the business employee retention credit. Um, when I've, we've presented information in the past and we've kind of compared the um, PPP or the payroll protection program against the employee retention credit, um, we, we've used those as a comparison of in the often reference annual numbers. And they do use annual numbers. But it's important here to understand that the whole point of these stimulus dollars is to provide immediate emergency need during the period of the disaster. For the employee retention credit, you can utilize wages paid from March 14th through December 31, 2020, which is great for those that are seasonal, that are looking ahead. But the key here, those wages qualify as long as the business can meet the necessary test to qualify that it was impacted by the disaster. And that test is done on a quarter by quarter basis. And so we have to be very careful here that if we're using what, what numbers we're using to determine whether which, entity, which program is going to make more sense. Um, so that for the employee retention credit, it's a very bright line test to determine eligibility. Whereas some of the other programs are, were you impacted in general? Um, this one has very specific requirements. One of the requirements is there's a full or partial shutdown for your business. And then, or, or, two, 50% reduction in revenue compared to the prior year quarter. So I wanna walk through this a little bit with you. Now, most businesses in Michigan, not all, but most, during the second quarter of 2020 are going to be impacted by a partial shutdown. So if you are, in, if you, uh, are impacted by the stay home, stay safe order, there's a partial shutdown and you would qualify for that particular quarter, so second quarter. So there you meet the test. Um, now, whether you qualify for third quarter, we're not sure. 
I'm standing here today, it's April 14th, so I'm hoping optimistically that we are back at things, the, the stay home, stay safe is long lifted by July 1st, which is the start of the third quarter. So if that's lifted, the likelihood of having a full or partial shutdown is probably pretty small as we're looking at it. So when we're kind of doing a high level comparison between the PPP and the employee retention credit, we really got to focus on just this particular quarter as it relates for the full or partial shutdown test. The other scenario that we can look at to see if you qualify for wages in a particular quarter is the 50% reduction in revenue. Again, it's an either or. So for most businesses, second quarter, we already qualify. So wages during that period are going to qualify. For third quarter, we want to see, okay, were, were revenues really impacted? Where I'm seeing this is if you can adjust your revenue on cash flow um, to maybe time it. If you happen to have a really good year last year during third quarter, and you're not anticipating as good of a quarter this year just because of the backlog. Maybe it's not coming yet until maybe fourth quarter. Um, that may apply. Um, but you want to look at your specific situation to determine whether we're going to use third quarter wages as to whether we want to consider those in the comparison between the two calculations. Um, so I want to make sure we get that out there pretty clear that the employee retention credit is you're going to want to focus on wages earned during a particular quarter that you were impacted by the disaster. And it's a much stronger threshold um, to be able to test that. <clears throat> so to be safe, you probably want to compare it to the second quarter um, and, and see if, as you look at it from that way. Okay, economic disaster, economic injury disaster loan. Um, I think if there's any um, program out there that has probably underperformed as compared to expectations, it was this particular program. Um, the PPP is actually going fairly well. It has its own issues, but that is starting, and I'm going to cover those. Um, the E employee retention credit is is pretty close to what we thought it was going to be. But the economic injury disaster loan certainly is not meeting up to what we were hoping it was going to meet. Um, the SBA first presented this out as a three-day quick inflow of cash of $10,000. Um, well, we're sitting here as of April 14th, and we have not seen hardly any dollars come through. We do have a couple clients that receive some payments on this loan program. But as we look at the details on those, those would have been applied prior or very early on in the early applications, not on the qu updated quick application that they put out there. So to, as I stand today, we are not aware of anyone that has been funded on this $10,000 quick um, cash stimulus that was supposed to come in three days from application. No, there is no way to verify whether your application was received or not, or, or uh, for the, to check on the status of it. That's not out there. They don't have it. Um, but here's where we're seeing a little bit of a unfortunate disconnect is when they originally talked about this program, they talked about loans up to $2 million and this is going to be a bridge, a true bridge um, that if you maybe you didn't need the payroll, but you wanted, you know, a real loan to cover some cash flow shortages um, that are as a result of this stimulus or as a result of this disaster, um, that this might be the program for you to go to. Yeah, the cash was nice. But many individuals that were actually looking at the EIDL were more gearing it towards a longer term loan, a 30 year loan for you know, upwards of what they needed to actually sustain a long term cash flow um, shortage. Um, the SBA has now come out recently um, and April 9th, they provided some guidance that said, okay, for one, the EIDL was way oversubscribed and they're just trying to sort through all of the applications. They, they don't even know how to respond to all of them yet. Um, but what they are providing is that the max loan that will be out there is $25,000. And where that comes up with is you've got your $10,000 potential grant plus the additional 15 for a max of 25,000 total per entity. Far short of what they had originally talked about and, and, and designed and intended um, just because of the amount of requests that they received on this particular program. Um, in, in addition, the, the borrowers are going to have 21 days to look through this program, but it has definitely moved from a short-term three-day application to a much longer drawn-out process for a much shorter and smaller dollar amount. And to add insult to injury, many of you, if you've already applied for the EIDL loan, 
um, that uh, you probably are getting emails here over the last three hours that are coming from the SBA to provide updated guidance on the EIDL program, um, which is again, probably contrary to what we were all hoping, which is that they are now basing from what we can see, and again, this is an email that came just this afternoon and this morning, um, they are basing the EIDL on the number of employees that a particular business has. So if you're a real estate entity, which we had been touting that as a potential for the EIDL may make sense, it's looking like this may not make sense now. Um, if you're an employee of one, we're gonna have to probably go back and reconsider, does the EIDL make sense if it's just one times a thousand to get a thousand? Now, again, I'm hoping that the 10,000 wasn't the only reason that we went with the EIDL, but there's also the unemployment and then there's some other programs that are conjun or that added together. Um, but this news, this new news that was just released is certainly going to um, make us reconsider some of the conclusions that we already had. And unfortunately, that's just the day and age that we're living in. And it's, it's hard to sift through all of these different programs. But what we are seeing here is that the, because of the level of subscription for the EIDL disaster program, um, that they are now limited it to the thousand dollars per employee. Um, so that's that's quite disappointing overall, but you know something we're just going to deal with. Um, again, I want to kind of reference back to that alphabet soup seminar that we had last week, knowing <laughs> again based on information we just received that some of the information is going to be different. Um, but what I want to kind of highlight then is it, it, we may find ourselves looking at the PPP or the Payroll Protection Program um, a little bit more and heightened awareness. Um, that, that was and it still is probably the, one of the primary programs that many businesses have looked at. I want to provide a little bit of an update on that. We have seen um, several applications be funded already. Um, so the, the general gist is it is far subscribed. It is not gone yet. Some of the expectations is that it'll be um, full by maybe April 17th, April 18th. I've seen a couple different um, sources use about those numbers. Um, again, so it's going to be fairly quick here. This is not one that you're, if you are deciding to go to the PPP, it's not one that you're gonna to wanna to delay around on. That's especially important for those of you that are self-employed that just now are being able to apply for it. Um, you're definitely gonna to wanna to get in sooner than later and talk with your banker on that program. We have seen many banks that have either accept, given acceptance. Um, so when you get acceptance, your banker will give you an SBA loan number. Um, that, that's kind of conf that's confirmation that you're at least in the queue and you your application is part of the process now and you've made it into the, the pool of funding, if you will. Um, we have now started seeing businesses get the actual dollars and are now actually having to start having discussions of where um, we're gonna spend it and how we're gonna utilize it. That's the same for the EIDL loan and others and that once you get them, we have to determine how we're gonna spend it. On that note, I'm gonna do a shameless plug for some of these other, or a few other webinars that we're gonna be doing um, going forward um, on this. And, and so one of these here is that Katie Fleece and Corinne DePisa are going to be doing a more detailed dive into how are we going to actually account for the PPP and the EDI loan, or EDL loan program um, within QuickBooks. What are some strategies and some tips that we're gonna to need to actually record the loan? How are we gonna track the expenses that are out there? You're starting to see some webinars and I'm gonna probably focus on our summary one next week, a little bit on some of the allowable expenses that are out there um, as we look at what we're gonna spend it from. But there's gonna be a whole separate sem uh, seminar um, that we're gonna to put together that's gonna to be very detailed, very focused, um, specific with screenshots and, and potentially even some live uh, working on you know truly question and answer type forms uh, within QuickBooks. Um, to help you as well. So if, if that's something of interest, I'd definitely recommend that you look out to insolutions.us slash envision. So envision is the seminar series that we're pulling together here for these. Um, and so sign up for those if you're interested in those classes and we're gonna be putting that form out there on our website as well. Um, we're not quite sure when and how that's gonna be deployed out. Um, we are accountants and we do like some um, to get things as detailed as possible. Um, but that will be coming very soon because we know these dollars are actually starting to make their way into bank accounts now. And so how recorded is gonna be pretty important. We do plan on continuing on 
these sessions here every uh, Tuesday at 1 p.m. As you saw today, the information is still flowing in, still coming through, and it may shift from now you're starting to recognize some of its terms and some of the different programs that are out there, but now cho choosing either which one you're gonna go with or actual application of, okay, how do we apply for it? Or once we've made the decision, what do we do now to strategize? Do I go on unemployment? Do I come off of unemployment and go on the PPP? Um, that's one I'm gonna take a little sidestep here and say what I am seeing many business owners that went with the PPP or the EIDL program are trying to decide when do I come off of unemployment um, to then shift, when do I pull my employees back? Do I do it in phases, do I not? Um, there is gonna be strategy on that and I might present on that in future topics. In the interim, I would suggest if this is something that you're dealing with this week, um, that you give us a call and we can help you work through some strategies of whether you want to pull people back this week or next week or what um, in there. So, I would also tell you to um, reference our website in trustcpa.us as well as integratedpayroll.us. Um, all of these webinars that are out that we've done here are out there as well as useful links and tips we're trying to filter through. Um, the SBA website is also has information as does the Michigan um, SBA or Michigan Business Administration. Um, they've got good information, but what we're trying to do is filter through just a whole slew of information that's out there and put it relevant to those that we work with that you might find it um, more, um, I guess, focused on information. We are pushing all of these out, as I mentioned earlier, on, on YouTube, and so you can see these um, this information later. Please feel free to forward them to friends or other business owners that you have. Um, we're not trying to be shy on this. We're not trying to um, have this solely be for our employee or our clients and that we want to get this information out as best as we possibly can to so that everyone here in Northern Michigan and elsewhere can benefit from these programs. Um, so please feel free to forward on these YouTube um, um, the YouTube videos or the emails that we're sending. Our goal here is to make them as, as open as possible for everybody. Uh, we also have a Facebook page um, that's out there. Um, we, we post some of the information that we're presenting here, some of the, um, the actual links and the uh, FAQs that are out there. Um, we're putting those out on our, our um, Facebook page as well as just some non-accounting things as well to keep us uh, real and, and understanding that not everyone likes accounting quite as much as we do. So. I, again, I just want to say thank you for attending. For, if you made it this far, I appreciate the tenacity you have to listen to these exciting uh, programs that are out there. Uh, please call us if you have questions. We are trying to answer each question individually and take them um, for what it is for your particular circumstances. Please um, also recognize and we thank you for the patience that we've um, had as we've basically put almost a stop on tax return preparation for the last week or so um, just to focus and prioritize and making sure that these dollars were truly benefited to everyone possible um, because we knew it was going to go so quick and so um, so it was so important to focus on these. We are starting to pick up speed again on tax returns again so please feel free to call if, if you have a specific need for one. Um, I would anticipate for self-employed individuals if you need those numbers for 2019 Give us a call if we haven't gotten your return done. Please keep focusing on, on, on those. We are focusing on them as well. Um, also, just as a little blur about there, know that the, you do not need an extension for the April 15th. It is an automatic extend, or it's an automatic new tax deadline of July 15th. So there's no extension needed. They just changed tax day from April 15th to July 15th. So no extension is needed for those. So don't worry, we've taken care of anyone um, that in, in the IRS is in the state of Michigan has taken care of that you do not need an extension. With that said, I'm gonna still stress that we are very well aware and we are still pushing forward on tax returns to get refunds coming out, to get information that's out there for these different loan programs, especially if you're self-employed. Um, so we're here, call us, we'll work through it. We'll, we're doing our best to prioritize um, on the specific needs of everyone that's, that's involved. Thank you again for listening and please don't hesitate to give us a call.
We just wanted to take a chance here a little bit too now as we s s step back and answer a few of the questions. Um, I know we had kind of mentioned earlier on in the presentation there that we were going to do some question and answers. We did get some uh, that came through the Q&A. You can keep adding those as well. And Steve in the background will also give us those as we work through it too. Um, but we did have a couple questions that Jeff, you had gotten during the presentation. Right. Uh, so both of these are regarding unemployment. So will self-employed individuals who incurred losses last year still qualify for unemployment benefits? So if your business had a loss and you're self-employed, can you qualify for unemployment benefits? Well, the most uh, recent uh, question or frequently asked question that I, that I read uh, yesterday indicate that as long as you can show that you had earnings or recent earnings or recent income that you can qualify, or um, if you cannot show recent earnings, then you may still qualify as someone who's a new job entrant. Um, and that's the difference between 300 a week or 600 a week. Overall, John, I don't think we really truly know the answer. Just go ahead and give it a shot anyway. Yeah, I'd give it a shot. I mean, it's one of those where you, were, you had a, a basis to show that you were working last year, but you may not have not in, not had net income. It's one of the nuances that the state's gonna have to figure out of how do you deal when you have self-employment? That's part of self-employment is you may have a loss for one particular year, you're still working, but not. You know, so we, we've, you've given the example there where you're a new employee in the, the $300, that may qualify. Um, and then on top of that, you might have a state. You, you just have to see on your particular circumstance of what may make sense. Um, it's so new and the state is, is just trying to figure these out. So I'd reference there the toolkit as well because they may have specific answers on that too. All right. The last question on unemployment. I am receiving unemployment from my employer. However, I'm also self-employed and believe I would receive a greater amount of unemployment through filing as a self-employed individual. Can I file both claims and will they give me the higher amount? What do you think about that one? I, my opinion is uh, you can't have two claims in the system at one time. Right. You can only have you can only have one file going on at once. So you probably have to you'd have you'd have to cancel the one claim and do another claim, and that would be on your my my WAM account is where it would be. So that'd be my thought. Uh, some more questions, not not regarding unemployment, but getting back to the PPP loan program. What if I get a uh, get PPP money, and the executive order to stay home is still in effect? Do I really have to pay my employees while they are at home? I'm getting this question a lot, actually, as um, owners are now starting to comprehend the whole PPP program. So they went through and they just applied for it because that seemed like that was the right way to go, and oftentimes was. Um, but then the, the, they got the dollars. We're actually seeing that these dollars come in. And so now they're saying, whoa, wait a second. I have to pull the employees back. Yes, the whole point of this program is that you're paying your employees while they're home. Well, what is pull your employee back? If it's during a period here, where they have, the, the in the state of Michigan, there's a stay home, stay safe order, you may be paying your employees to sit at home. That That's part of the process that the, and contemplated within the program. So yeah, the answer is, is that, that that's what was contemplated. There's some strategies that we may look to say, well, let's maximize unemployment as long as we can, and then still hit some of those later in the eight week period, because you, you have an eight week period um, that maybe we pay some during that period through bonuses and because you're gonna be paying overtime. You know, I look at the, say the construction industry where they're, they're hoping that if on um, June or on, on May 1st, the order is lifted, it's gonna start going right away and they might have 60, 70 hours a week of, over, or of, of working, so you're gonna be paying overtime. So you're gonna to wanna to think about overtime in part of that calculation as well. Um, and so as, as we look through, there is some strategies on when and how you pull them back, but to answer that specific question, it's, it definitely is something that the, the program contemplated of having people be paid while they're, um, while they're at home. And, and as you mentioned, the coverage period, we have another question here as to why are there two different coverage periods noted within the PPP program? Well, the first, the first coverage period is this February 15th through June 30th. What that's getting after is the uses of funds. So when you apply for that PPP loan, you're saying I'm going to use funds for a specific purpose. And so that period of time is, is that use of funds period of time to meet the loan standards. Then secondarily, you have the loan forgiveness period. 
So if you're using funds for a qualifying purpose, starting on the date that your loan originates, so the day you close on your loan in eight weeks thereafter, then you have a shot at having that loan forgiven up to 100%. So that's why there are two different coverage periods being noted in the guidance, but take note, they, they both end at June 30. We got one other question here uh, from Tammy. Um, as a single member LLC, I applied for the $10,000 grant part of the EIDL last week. Should I sign up for unemployment? Um, you may qualify for unemployment and the EIDL at the same time. So those two programs are not exclusive. So you can do you can do both of those. I would note, if, because of the information we just got today, um, that the EIDL grant, in your particular case, may be only limited to $1,000 because it's based off of one employee. And even that, we don't know if it's going to be zero because there's no employees or if it's going to be 1000 So it's, we're going to have to kind of figure that out as, as this new guidance is comprehended a little bit further. Um, so yes, uh, Tammy, I would, I would certainly say that if, if you meet the qualifications for unemployment, you may also look at that. Um, as, as an um, additional funding for you as well. Um, that does bring up another point here. And again, this, this, that email, I, I mentioned it in the presentation, but that email came out literally five minutes before we were uh, going live here. And so we're still comprehending some of these things. We had an inclination of that. Yesterday, we saw some guidance off of it. Um, we weren't quite sure if it was going to be official. We thought we were, the sources we were getting them from, we weren't quite positive on it. Um, we definitely are seeing this email coming from the SBA about the $1,000 per employee. Um, and I have gotten um, several calls this morning on it um, of people asking, should I change course? Um, you may, as I think through it, I don't know of many that will actually change course. If the EIDL and the PPP, I'm sorry, if the EIDL and the um, unemployment and the employee retention credit made sense for a particular employee group or company, it probably isn't going to immediately shift over to doing the PPP just because of that limitation. It may be there, but it, it, it may not be. And so I wouldn't just say abandon all hope and say well, it was wrong to begin with. It just means we're going to have to look back at it. Um, Certainly facts and circumstances apply here. Yeah. And I think the ones that are, are asking that question are the, say, the single employer um, who have, you know, the, the sole proprietor, the um, S corporation that has one or two employees where we're anticipated at $10,000 and now all of a sudden it's it's a thousand dollars. Well, you got to look at the wages there, and then if you factor in the employee retention credit, which has a potential to be five thousand dollars as well, it pretty quickly can come at least comparable. And so, um, I think we will want to facts and circumstances each 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 case. But I wouldn't jump ship just because of that email. So, looks like we have one more question coming in there, and I have one last question. So let's let's go ahead and resolve this last question that I have written down. Uh, this. This is regarding loan forgiveness. When it comes time to calculate loan forgiveness, you will need to calculate full-time equivalent employees. So you need to count your workforce based on average full-time equivalents. Right now, there is not any guidance as to whether full-time means 30 hours per week, which is under the Affordable Care Act, or 40 hours per week, which is normal standard calculations. Uh, so we're, we're still waiting on that sort of guidance. Uh, regardless, uh, the banks will also will be issuing some sort of calculator, I'm sure, to help with, in calculating loan forgiveness. So the banks will interpret one thing, we'll interpret one thing. Uh, fingers crossed the SBA will, will issue a fix. Yeah, and I've been jokingly telling people, you know, we've had to comprehend what it is to get the PPP loan within a week, um, basically, to try to get it in place. Given eight weeks, we're going to have a whole lot of time to strategize on that too. And so the, the banks are going to have more time to comprehend what does that loan forgiveness look like. We're going to have time to comprehend it as well. Um, you cannot apply for the loan forgiveness until after the eight-week period. That is one thing that did come out. Um, and so they, they contemplated it or contemplated as part of the um, application. But the actual loan forgiveness doesn't happen until afterwards. So we do have some time to strategize, which includes maybe bonuses right at the end. Um, so definitely be thinking about that, whether you're going to hire people back by June 30, there's that caveat. So your eight week period may be before and before the June 30th cutoff to hire employees back. So there's going to be some strategies there. Um, so um, lots of strategy, but lots of time there to think through it as well. Um, the other question that we asked was, that, that came out was, is, is our sales 
occur primarily between May and October? Do we need to wait until May to apply for unemployment benefit? Um, so unemployment, my, my, my immediate response off of this, and again, knowing that we're not unemployment experts by any means, um, but our, our, my thought on that is unemployment is not necessarily a function of sales, rather a function of work. Um, and so when you go through the questions, what I would do is take each question individually and answer, can you answer them yes or no? And if you can answer them yes, then, then it applies. And so if you're able to work and you're not being compensated for it, then it would potentially apply because you had earnings in the past and you're not receiving benefits for it. So it, it's, it's one that you'd have to definitely look at that each individual question would be my, my thought. If you have any thoughts. Uh, no, nothing more to add there. Steve, did you see any other questions come in while we were talking here? So. No, that, that was all of them. Okay. Well, uh, again, thank you for participating in the webinar here. Um, we are going to be making this um, available on our website and on YouTube, um, so feel free to forward those on um, and feel free to um, like and subscribe as well so that way you see these coming through, especially keep a lookout for Katie and Corinne's um, in detail application of how do we start accounting for these as well. Um, we've got other videos coming through, so look forward to seeing you on, on those and next Tuesday. Thank you for coming.